Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dennis. I'm technical on vacation. I just randomly got dragged into giving this talk. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah. Um, so this talk is going to be a bit more kind of like overview of what's going on, more than kind of in-depth explanation of things. And then we can go in-depth on whatever you're interested in. Uh, so I'm currently doing, I'm a research assistant at EPFL. And I'm working on this project called Scala Native. So what is it? So the core idea of Scala Native is to compile Scala ahead of time. Ahead of time compilers are not a new thing. They've been a while for a long time. And languages like C and C++ are primarily compiled this way. So the project is actually quite recent. Like the very first prototype was announced a bit more than a year ago. And we've seen the first release in March this year. And and in a few words, uh, Scala Native is native code compiler. It is based on LLVM compiler infrastructure. And it's primarily interested in uh, you know, advancing the state of the art of ahead of time and like whole program opti optimizing compilation. Uh, in this talk, I would like to highlight kind of the four interesting parts of Scala Native, which I consider to be our like, main selling uh, points. Uh, so First, first selling point, which is different from any uh, from the main uh, reference implementation top of JVM, is ahead of time aspect. Uh, our second selling point is that it's still Scala; it's not a new language, so you don't have to learn anything really. Uh, we also have great interoperability with native code uh, like C, and we also have a new feature which was introduced just recently in 03, is pr predictable garbage collection. So, first thing is ahead of time. So what does it even mean? So typically, the way uh, you do Scala, it's like that. Uh, typically, the way you use Scala uh, on JVM is that you have a front-end compiler, which is either Scala C or Dotty, uh, but it doesn't matter, like S Scala 2.11, for example. You use a Scala compiler to compile Scala files to class files, and those class files are run on JVM. JVM is a very elaborate, complicated beast. So it actually has not one, but two compilers. It has bytecode interpreter, and has this very elaborate scheme of slowly getting your code to be compiled faster and faster as it goes from interpreter to C1 to C2. And of course, if the code is compiled. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to stay compiled uh, because of the thing called de-optimizations. So uh, the code compiled by JVM uh, can sometimes de-optimize back to interpreter if one of the conditions that JVM expected to happen didn't quite happen. And all of this, of course, happens during runtime. So it means that your application has to compete with, uh, on system resources at first few seconds uh, and sometimes minutes until the VM warms up. So not only does it have to do your workload you're actually doing, but it also has to compile your code. And of course, this has a performance overhead, and this has a well-known problem of very slow and very um, unpleasant JVM startup time and warm up time. So none of this is free. Of course, once your, your VM is warmed up, which can vary from seconds to minutes based on the size of your code base, like for example, first Scala C takes minutes to reach peak performance, uh, code is pretty much stable and stays native code. But this kind of like startup aspect is really expensive for some apps that only run for a short period of time. So, in Scala Native, we don't do it, any compilation at runtime. So all of the compilation is done before your app is actually run, so it, hence the ahead of time uh, explanation. So the whole pipeline is a bit more elaborate because we kind of need to do to move some of the functionality which you previously saw on JVM to uh, compile time stage. So first of all, emitting a high-level bytecode wouldn't work because high-level bytecode is not a machine understandable thing. So you need to go all the way from high level bytecode, which in, in our case is called NIR, and transform it all the way to native code. And this involves going from NIR to LVMIR and uh, LVMIR going to uh, machine dependent IR and from machine dependent IR going to native code. So it's really a very elaborate, very long chain, and quite a few, a few things happen. So apart from this uh, front end compiler part, which is more or less the same, we reuse uh, Scala C unchanged, so all of your high-level language features uh, stay uh, have the same semantics. Like for example, 
macros are expanded the same way, implicits are inferred in the same way, uh, type inference is done in the same way because it's essentially the same compiler to start with. And then in the end, we add this NIR thing. We just flip the switch from emitting class files to emitting NIR files apart from that. And then the interesting part happens. Basically, the main added value of our project is the stuff that happens afterwards. Uh, so in Scala Naive, we do quite a bit of transformation before we hand off the code to LLVM. Uh, so first of all, we do whole program tree shaking. So what it means is that we only, that given the entry point and your whole class path, we only keep parts which you actually need. And this can make a dramatic impact on a binary size and it can also make a dramatic impact on how much we can do later in terms of optimizations. Because the less code you have, uh, the more limited closed world you have, the better you can the virtualize virtual calls, the better you can uh, shrink down your code to smaller size, the more you can inline uh, preserving the same output binary size, for example, and so on and so forth. So it's actually very important for us to pre-optimize the code before we hand it off to LLVM. And next up is LLVM. So LLVM is um, a very uh, pluggable, interchangeable compiler toolchain. So the main value of LLVM is that it has a well-defined intermediate representation called LLVM IR. And it has LL uh, file extension. Um, and essentially, the main value of LLVM as a project is that it has a shared infrastructure for all of the standard things you would typically want in most compilers. Like it has all of the well-known standard SSA optimizations like global value numbering and whatnot. It has excellent loop optimizer and auto vectorizer, which seems to be quite a bit better than the one uh, we have on JVM, actually. Uh, and it also does all of the uh, going from IR to native code parts, like instruction selection, register allocation, and actual code generation. And that's basically an excellent choice for Scala because it means we don't have to do any of this. So we only have to make sure we emit code which is friendly for LLVM to optimize. And like. To sum up, ahead of time ha has a few benefits. So first of all, it's startup time, because all of this heavy machinery you've seen for JVM doesn't exist. It has very predictable performance, because your code is compiled once, there is no de-optimization ever. So it's good and bad. It's very good in terms of predictability, because whatever performance you get, it's, it's going to stay there, and it's going to be consistent, which we will see later. And Lastly, it also produces small self-contained binaries because we invest heavily in doing stuff like tree shaking, which shrinks down your class pass to the smallest reasonable subset we can prove uh, to be necessary. So our second uh, selling point uh, is the fact that we are highly compatible with Scala and JVM. And we are very proud to say we are the same language at the core. And what does this mean is that we have the same semantics minor, uh, there exists some minor semantic differences on edge cases, like what happens if you reference an null pointer. But those typically are like stuff where your VM would crash anyway. It just, we crash differently. Um, all of the language features are supported because we reuse the same front-end compiler to start with. And even obscure part like structural types, which took us some time to get right because uh, it's a virtual dispatch for to make virtual dispatch for, for this to work efficiently is not trivial. And we also care a lot about libraries. So we don't just provide a small language subset without uh, any kind of library support story. In terms of libraries, we invest heavily in uh, providing a reasonable environment, which you would, which you're already used to. So this includes Scala library, of course, like things like collections and whatnot. And most of it, modulus and minor parts like parallel collections works out of the box. You don't have to do anything. You can just use your favorite collections and just don't even think about it. We also provide a, a re-implementation of things like Java Lang, Util, IO, and IO, and Net uh, built in. So you can do stuff like Java style files and not even worry if it's JVM or native. It's highly important for writing compatible code across different platforms. So. We don't implement all of these packages completely. We only implement parts which people typically use. So for complete list, please go to that link um, to see what we actually have. So s s some of the parts are still missing. Like for example, net, is, net support is very, very rough and we are 
working on that at the moment. And apart from that, we also provide bindings for uh, Lipsy and POSIX APIs. Uh, so if you wanted to go lower level of JVM and, but couldn't do it before, you can now. For a build system, we use SBT. Um, and there are very few things you need to know to use SBT with Scala Native, is that you have to enable one plugin, which is just one line, and your um, project uh, build SBT. And there is this nice, easy to use template called Scala Native, Scala Native .g8, and you can make an instance of it with SBT new. And apart from that, we also have something called SBT cross project, which is another plugin which lets you easily cross compile against JavaScript, JVM, and native. And it's based on previous work by Scala GS guys to do a cross project against JVM and GS, but now it's extended to support all platforms. This infrastructure will also be used in Scala GS as an official way to do cross projects starting from Scala GS 1.0, which is in development right now. So, um, next point is, is interoperability. And when I mean interoperability, I mean interop with native code. Um, so, has anyone here used GNI before? Can you raise your hand? Uh, keep, keep your hand if you liked it. <laughs> okay, no hands, good. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's like it takes a lot of ceremony to call uh, C code from JVM. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. So, here's just a rough comparison of what you would need to do to call um, method foo in C, which takes a pointer and, doesn't, and does something s stateful. Uh, it's basically this simple. Uh, so, you need to import our magic import thingy, which provides stuff like at extern. Um, but other, and, and pointer of t, but otherwise it's just a simple Scala object which just have a single method signature and it defined as extern, and that's all you need to do to call method foo. And this is it should not be more difficult than that. You should not be obliged to write ten layers of wrappers to call a simple function. That's basically it. And then to, to call it, you just say um, you allocate memory through c malloc, and then you call it with um, just standard straightforward Scala syntax. There is no C code, there is no uh, uh, like wrappers, there is no nothing, it's just basically that's it. And you can call it, it's uh, basically as simple as that. Uh, to make it work, we provide a bit of like low level types and kind of like language extensions, I would say almost, because Scala JVM doesn't support any of this uh, fancy interrupt stuff. Uh, this part of API is a bit of like an experimentation and development. We are constantly trying to refine it and make it even simpler than that. Um, I think we're quite happy with extern uh, semantics, but like, the way structs and arrays works might be changed a bit. But the main kind of core idea is we want to expose low-level uh, parts of, of your machine language uh, unchanged with the same semantics as in C. We don't want you to have to go through hoops to write low-level code, because sometimes you have to. Sometimes uh, GC performance just doesn't scale like on, on giant hips. It just, there are a few well-known problems which are just not solved right now in managed languages, like uh, garbage collection on, like, on very complicated heaps is, is, is a very open question right now. And of course, sometimes you just need to use that library, which is really good from C, and it should be easy. It, it, it shouldn't require you to write horrible DNI code. And of course, all of this has like, no performance overhead. So the calls to C have the same uh, cost as calls in C. OK, um, and my I think it's the last bullet point for today is predictable garbage collection. Um, so when I mean predictable, I don't mean necessarily like state-of-the-art fast. I mean you should understand when it happens and it should be predictable and very easy to reason about. So right now we have three different strategies for garbage collection. So the first one is called BoyMGC and that's what we've been having for all, all of the time. This is a standard uh, garbage collection uh, we depend on as a library. Then we have something called no GC or like native GC none. And it's basically an option to completely turn off the garbage collector if you have enough memory for your app and you don't want to worry about um, performance of, of garbage collector. And then we have a, a new fancy thing which is called MX and I'm going to talk about it soon. So Boim GC was our first garbage collector. We didn't develop it. Uh, it was there from before and it was originally designed as a garbage collection uh, to be plugged into C, C++ environments. So it has a very simple API, very easy to use as a language implementer, but it 
its performance is a bit lacking. So we ported quite a bit of benchmarks to Scalinate. So every single bar here is a benchmark. Uh, so right now, all of them are like one. Uh, it means like there is no baseline because uh, you know to have a baseline, you have to compare two things. So what do you compare it with? So the thing we did to understand uh, the cost of GC is called no GC. So no GC is a setting to completely turn off garbage collection. And what it does, it uh, basically provides a dummy GC implementation, which just allocates memory and never frees. So if you have enough memory or if your app is just doesn't allocate much, or if you have insane latency uh, requirements, I've seen some people do that actually on, on JVM proper uh, to basically fork a JVM and do a, a GC that doesn't have any overhead. So for some kind of like super sensitive, super latency sensitive apps, you want that. And of course it has zero overhead because there is no garbage collection, it's just only allocation. And there's this cool story from uh, 1995 uh, so there is this language called ADA. Have you ever heard of ADA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was like the systems language, the systems language before Rust, like the safe systems language. And, um, you know, there was a story by, um, by this guy, uh, Kent Mitchell, and he was doing some consulting for, for a company which was doing uh, like ro rocket missiles. And, you know, he was trying to, like, he saw this app and like, for Rocket, and it was actually leaking memory a lot. And he was trying to figure out how would they even like support that, you know, like this doesn't make any sense. And when he asked like the main guy, like well, what's going on, like this part leaks memory. And he answered, yeah, it leaks memory, it's fine. We calculate exactly uh, as, as rate of memory leakage and by the time it explodes, it, it, it's like it has enough, you know. <laughs> yeah, and when it, Yes, ultimately, <laughs> it's getting a garbage collection, exactly. It's like ultimate form of garbage collection. And the main reason why we did it is to have a baseline for our kind of like to understand the cost of GC. And this basically kind of the performance we saw is that our existing GC is very slow. Uh, and when I say very slow, I mean sometimes it gets to up to five times slower than no GC, which is very bad. I mean, this is like, we knew it was bad. Uh, approximate average across all the benchmarks is around 2x slower than no GC which is also what we expected before on empirical evaluation of, um, of GC performance based on profiles. Um, and we, you know, obviously it was not good. So this kind of performance, like five times slower than OGC is like not good. So we had to do something better, right? So we developed our own artisanally crafted garbage collector uh, based on prior work uh, by St Stephen Blackburn and Catherine McKinley. Uh, there was this paper called MX and Mark Region Garbage Collector, la la la. And it's like an actually an excellent paper. It's like one of the best papers on garbage collection I've read in years. And it presents a very simple idea of Mark Region Garbage Collector, which is not something anyone else has because it's like from 2008. Most of production ready GCs are based on research from late 90s and like early 2000s approximately. This is kind of new by GC uh, standards, like 2008 is new. And we basically just implemented that idea. We didn't do anything super insanely better than this. We, we just took whatever they had and based on, on their uh, findings, we did something very similar. And the performance we got was very nice. Uh, so this work was done by Lucas Kallenberger. So all of the credits for amazing performance of our new collector go to him. Uh, so uh, as you see, like blue one is a new collector and r red one is a old one. It's typically like very fast. It's like around 20% slower than uh, no GC on average. And we probably can do b better still without like doing something completely crazy like generational GC. So MX is very good as a concept and we managed to have a reasonable implementation of that. One of the main benefits uh, why it works so much better is because the previous one was conservative. It has less information to work with. This one is precise and it also has a better underlying GC strategy. We also tried implementing a uh, single generation market sweep and it was quite a bit slower than that. Um, all this like kind of experimentation work w was done by Lucas and he did a great job. And now the predictable part, right? I had not just like fastish garbage, I said predictable. So uh, now here's the chart that it has um, on XY, you have iteration number N. So basically 
you can imagine this as an HTTP app taking requests, right? So it's like, it takes HTTP requests, it processes them, it creates some garbage, and does a new one, a new one, a new one. And here we have like a performance which is like y-axis is basically number of cycles it took to perform, uh, perform the action. So as you can see, once you go past initial like hip size uh, growing induced slowdown, it, go, it gets to very, very stable performance with minor hiccup. But overall, it's, like, it's very, very stable with very predictable pause times. So for example, if you were really scared of pause times, you could have like given enough memory and uh, made sure you, it only triggers when you're not actually responding to GC. Which is kind of nice because the performance without GC is basically the same as no GC, as you can see. So no GC is the lowest one, which is basically as good as it can be without garbage collector. And when it doesn't GC, it basically is at that point. And on top you have Boyam GC, which is our previous one, and you see it's very noisy. It's, it's like all over the place. It has quite a bit of variation. You never know when it's gonna hit. Uh, here is one more where the variation of, from Boyam is quite a bit worse. Uh, and you see like GC cost can be quite big uh, for Boyam while on MX as the green line is very, very stable. And one more. Uh, so needless to say, like green line is always m much faster than blue one, right? Uh, it just barely any higher than uh, no GC, which is typically like t 10 to 20 percent overhead. So what is the y axis? Uh, so uh, y is number of cycles. So basically, less is better, and x is iteration number. Cool. Uh, yeah. So. This was like a very brief introduction on, onto like wide area of stuff we have. Uh, to learn a bit more about Entrop, uh, there is this nice talk from Scala Days called Hands-On with Scala Native uh, by Guillaume and Martin. It basically walks through, through creating a very simple app which uses Entrop and just does some s a simple uh, terminal UI uh, thing. And then we have a very detailed talk on garbage collection by me and Lucas and it basically uh, gives you a bit more story to towards MX and how we arrived upon MX. I think both of those uh, should be available on YouTube now. And yeah, I think they are. Um, then you have our official website and docs, uh, which is colony.org. Uh, this is a place to see what the current release is, what, what are the latest docs. And then you have, we have a Twitter account where we up announce every single release so, and some other stuff, like exciting stuff going on around. And that's about it. Thanks. Uh, yeah? Um, so I'm wondering with structural types. So I know in the JVM implementation they use reflection. Mm. So I don't suppose you support reflection. No. So how do you. <laughs> um, it's a very good question. Um, so you can think of it as every single type, basically, every single object in memory has a type pointer. Does it make sense? The type pointer is something like a place that has V tables, like class ID, class name, and all of this other stuff. Basically things we use to support different types of virtual dispatch. And for every class which implements at least one structural type which was observed during whole compilation, we have a something called perfect hash map. So it's like a pre-computed, pre-specialized hash map, uh, which does a lookup, uh, like given a method ID, what kind of result I would get. And essentially, it just basically a hash map. So it's a hash map lookup. And it's quite a bit faster than reflection because it's very specialized for uh, a list of known uh, supported structural types and list of possible implementations. So it's kind of small in memory and in terms of uh, binary size, and it's kind of fast. As in, it's probably like around like up to six times slower than, uh, than normal virtual calls through VTable because it has quite a bit of interaction to make hash table thing work. Uh, we have an idea how to make it essentially up to par uh, on speed with normal virtual calls, which we don't see on JVM actually, uh, but it's not done yet. So it's like it's just research stuff. Um, yeah. Hey. Yeah? Uh, what, what doesn't work? What doesn't work? Yeah, reflection, I think. That's reflection has, it basically you can do get class, get name. You can do some other like very simple queries on, on classes. Uh, you cannot do get field, you cannot do 
get method call it. You cannot do get constructor make an instance. So this doesn't work. Some of it might work. Some of the stuff we plan to support, and um, the only thing we cannot support by design is class loading. So essentially, all of the like the list of available classes is fixed statically, and this kind of like constrained by the ahead of time part, because we like do tree shaking. We get a list of all possible reachable classes, and that's basically it, right? If your class is outside of this list, you will not be able to find it uh, reflectively. But everything else is possible to support. Probably it's going to be like opt-in if we ever support it because it will introduce more cost for binary size. Because for every class, you will need to store all this metadata, like a place of every field, like uh, in memory, and like offsets, and uh, you know, list of all fields, list of all methods, names, types, and so on and so forth. So it, it will take more binary size. So I, I don't think we'll ever have it enabled by default. But it's likely that we're going to have some kind of opt-in uh, for people who really need it. But again, it, it has to be like no class loading, basically. So you have to statically know what you want. So uh, what, what else doesn't work uh, is that Java library is pretty much like work in progress. So um, lots of stuff works that's actually, and that's very cool. Like uh, latest big thing that got merged is file.io. So we have like almost complete implementation of Java IO file.io and Java NIO file file.io, which was a giant piece of work by Martin Duhem from Scala Center. And it was very impressive. Um, some things are just not available at all at the moment, like sockets are still uh, basically in a development branch. We haven't uh, shipped them yet. Um, otherwise, the language basically, I, I don't think we have any like Scala language problems. We typically have library problems. I think that's basically the main area, like reflection is also basically a library problem, even though it does need some compiler support. Uh, Language-wise, I think we're pretty well covered. As, like, I mean, 0.1, which was in March, uh, it's, um, blocker was to support every single language feature. So it's basically kind of, um, and we are at 0 0.3 now, so yeah. Yeah? yeah. Have you tried to um, compile uh, well, libraries like Ipcal or these? So libraries we try like all the time. It's basically our main driver towards implementing more Java library. We don't just randomly implement stuff because we have other stuff to do, right? So we need to find parts which actually people are, which are used by libraries. So we try to compile stuff. Uh, it always goes all the way to IR. It's basically like a given. Uh, but going past linker means we have to have all the libraries it depends on, right? And sometimes some parts of Java libraries are not there. So we file issues like linking errors for library X. And we try this all the time. Um, basically, pure functional libraries like Scala that just work. So um, for example, Scala that and all of its like tests, uh, which don't depend on the parts of Java library we don't have, which is like all of the core parts, are already published to Solon type for native, so you can just use them. Um, some other libraries like starting to slowly uh, publish stuff for native. Um, we are working towards better files, like all this cool library for nicer file IO to work. It's based on an IO file. Um, there are quite a few libraries we're actively trying to, to basically, basically we're, uh, our work on Java library is biased towards like, existing libraries. I think the latest one we did was uTest and FastParse uh, from uh, Lee Howie. Um, so it's, it's going pretty well, I would say. Is there, <coughs> is there any interest in using something like Rust's uh, burrow checker, or is Emix so good that it's? Uh, so, so Rust, so why don't you, so basically the question was, well, why don't we use ownership? So ownership is cool thing if you build a language around it. It's almost impossible to add it to garbage collector language later. I mean, I'm not saying it's po not possible. It just Scala is already a big language. It might be a cool research project to try this, but I would I would probably think that the result would be so complicated you don't we, you won't want to use it. And I'm pretty confident that for most apps, garbage collection is really not a bottleneck with MX. Um, definitely not true for all for all apps. Like on giant hips, we have the same problems at JVM. Like, so the post times will get so it's a trace and garbage collector you will get post times pro proportional to the heap size. So if you have giant heaps, you'll have proportional post times. So we haven't solved that yet. There are not completely well known, but like there is active research on, on basically on doing postless GC. We are following that. And if there's something reasonable we can implement, we'll probably do that. Uh, so garbage collection is not perfect, but at the same time, Rust approach is not perfect either because of the complexity in the language. So uh, I hope this answers your question. Yeah. Uh, do you see something like uh, multi-threading actually being 
difficult to implement because of the garbage collection algorithms or systems that you've used? Garbage collection integration, like interaction with strats is very well studied. So we know how it works, how it's supposed to work. We don't have it implemented because we don't have threads, so we, it wasn't a pressing concern yet. Yeah. But it's a very standard technique. You do save points, you wait all threads to, like, to stop at save point, and then you GC, and then you resume. So it's it's extremely like well-studied approach. So it's not like uh, low-post GC is that like, there are some solutions, but nobody has officially solved it yet. I mean, Azul claims to have officially solved it, but their solution costs like thousands of dollars per CPU. So. Uh, uh, so basically, there are no uh, open so open uh, open solutions that I know of which are like reasonable to implement. So I think it's basically one of the hot areas in in, in research right now is trying to do uh, very low post GC on very giant hips. So um, we're interested in that thing, but multi threading is easy, so it's like nothing like that. So it, it's a well studied problem. As soon as we have threads, our GC will work with it. Yeah. What's the size of the execute binary for Helper? Hello world is two megabytes. If you don't strip uh, debug info, like if you want st stack traces, okay. and it's like 1.4, 1.5 if you st strip debug info. Okay. So if you don't want base, if, if you are fine without stack traces, it will be basically busy. Some conditions like to remove standard library for some Yeah. So basically, the tree shaking part is okay. uh, it's doing quite a lot. So it would have been way bigger otherwise. Uh, so like way bigger, like standard libraries with megabytes. So it's it's a bit like intense with megabytes. So. Um, how does that grow if you start including like Very slowly. Very slowly because sta like standard set is 4,000 methods and 1,000 classes. So if you add 4,000 methods more, it will be 4 megabytes basically approximately. So it's like, it's like very slow growth. Um, I think the biggest um, uh, binary I've seen was around 10 megabytes and it had like 20,000 methods or something like So basically approximate numbers. Uh, so it's all proportional to the size of your whole world kind of view. And we can shave a lot from that. Um, it hasn't been a person issue. Like nobody r really complained. You can also use um, stuff like um, binary compressors. Uh, they're very good. And they sh shrink our binaries to like hundreds of kilobytes if you really care about that, about the size for some reason. It will hurt you a bit in, s in s startup time. Or if you want to just distribute, you can zip. It will also shrink it quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, what performance check benchmarking has it compared to Kubernetes and those stuff? I'm sorry, uh, performance uh, benchmark. So performance benchmark, OK. So how does this compare to C++? So we have this low-level language, and we have, ha have high-level language. If you are happy to write low-level code like in C++, you would get low-level performance. If you're not so carefully use high-level features, you can shoot yourself in, in, in the foot performance-wise. So there are a few places which where we, we can easily explode in terms of a performance slowdown. Uh, like for example, boxing is quite disproportionately slower compared to JVM right now. We have a solution in the works. It's not solved yet. It's really slow right now, the boxing part. Does um, so that mean do the Dottie, like Dottie linker? So Dottie is a new front end. It's basically not really. I mean, so Dottie linker is basically uh, so if we go to this original picture, so that linker is basically a fork of front-end compiler to do some optimizations before anything happens. Uh, but as far as I can tell, uh, uh? Uh, we have a prototype for Dottie, but it's not officially supported yet uh, because it's a bit hard. Like both Scala-Native and Dottie are kind of like very fast moving, so it was a bit hard to kind of keep them in sync. Uh, we had a prototype. It's just not up to date uh, with either Scala or native or Dottie. So um, this will probably change once once Scala native and Dottie stabilize a bit. But essentially, that linker is like a fork here, and just do a bit of more optimizations before we go to Scala native. That's how it's going to look like. As far as I know, there have been some attempts to do specialization, which might solve boxing. Uh, but it's like it working for us. So uh, it's um, yeah. So. Our solution, like the problem with specialization is that it duplicates code. So you will explode in terms of code size if you're not careful, just like in C++. Uh, and you will explode in terms of compile time. So it's not ultimate solution, uh, as far as I can tell. There is another solution which we can do, but you cannot do it on JVM, which is called SMI, which is a small integer optimization. And it basically means for small integers, and when I say small, I mean less than, it fits in 
33 bits, you can pack it into pointers, and then it just you don't allocate. You just mask it into a pointer, and then you unmask it back. So basically, box and box is free. I think this is probably what we're going to do uh, like medium term, uh, because that you don't have to duplicate code with SMICE. You have to duplicate code with specialization. So we're kind of scared of specialization, I think, for Scalinv, because exponential blow up of code size means exponential blow up in, co in compile times. And we've seen how this worked out in C++, right? Um, not well. <laughs> uh, yeah? One of the big problems that you have with code actually writing like C and C++ and such is that platforms all ship their own slightly different versions of common headers. And so you end up with a lot of differences between systems. Um, right. So do you generally, I assume that so far that hasn't been a major problem because you've restricted people's code to mostly things like libc and stuff, which are pretty common. But so is there? I think people reported it to work on different plastics compatible systems. We haven't had problems yet. We might get problems because of that. We are super careful. I, I know what you're talking about. It is a problem that, uh, for example, POSIX is defined in terms of syntactical compatibility. It's not defined in terms of binary symbols in the final binary. So we go a long way to make carefully sure it, it doesn't break for if you're, for example, if you're, uh, I don't know, STD out. It's not actually called STD out, but it's like something else under the hood hidden by a macro, right? We kind of account for that. So it's like, it, it's been tried on, so, we have CI for Linux and Mac, which have very different POSIX implementations. For like, like, trust me, like very different. And and people try it on FreeBSD. We haven't. We don't have CI on FreeBSD. I, I cannot guarantee it works, but I think like no one complained so far. We have one very brave person trying. Uh, like I, I I hope he keeps struggling uh, doing a port for Windows. And it's been uh, um, I I'm, I, I'm gonna get to that PR like super soon because it's like I, I really want Windows to happen. Their stuff gets very tricky. It's like POS6 is not existing on, on Windows, right? So it's um, it's like, like that's really hard, yeah. Um, yeah well, it's difficult to get working on that. Yeah, it's like on Windows, like all those things you expect to just work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe too early, but what about the community? Do you have users? So uh, for in terms of like users, we don't know for sure. Uh, we track the downloads counts, and we get like 100 downloads on a bad day, and like two to two, 300 on a bad day, uh, on a good day. So on release days, it's like almost up to 1,000. So I don't, I don't really know how much users we get, but it's like 100 downloads of the plugin jar, like for SBT, which we use to track. Basically, it's probably more than 100 people, I would assume. I mean. Uh, I really don't know, so I we, we don't have like you know um, a forum to track, and we don't track you, so uh, it just um, in terms of d downloads, basically those are the numbers, um, and you can follow those I think on Bintray uh, in our organization. You can just open a plugin, and so quite a few people are trying to publish stuff in terms of community, like publish existing projects. The number is slowly growing. It's like you know one project at a time. You know it's like it only takes like ten projects to exponentially grow. You know at the, at the state. Uh, but um, I think we have like around like 15-ish kind of libraries published uh, to native, and it's slowly going, growing over time as we implement more and more Java library. So Java library is a blocker here um, for existing projects. But yeah, we see new and new stuff published every day, and we have lots of activity on our official Gitter chat room, which is the official place to hang out if you're interested in the project. I, I hope this answer your question because I have no idea. Like uh, a proper answer, I have no idea. Any more quick? Yeah. So um, I probably play around with a little bit. But if I want to interface with um, native uh, code like you show, like native library, um, I just going to have to resort to pointers and C strings yeah. things like that. Do you have any recommendations for that bridge between like the Scala world and moving? Try to wrap pointers and stuff as, as quickly as possible and n not expose them as your official API. So pointers and stuff is only meant for interrupt. It's not meant to be used everywhere all across your code base. Uh, you can. I mean, we're not going to stop you. So we're all adults here. So uh, if you want to have like pointer heavy APIs and like very level APIs, you can do that. I would advise just wrap stuff into managed object as fast as possible. Like basically the first layer of, 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 of your interaction should just wrap everything to managed object, which carefully frees everything as you need it. We also have something called zones, which automatically free memory uh, 
without you having to worry about it. So you say zone curly brace block, and then you can allocate there, and then it frees automatically. This is super convenient for uh, dealing with use cases when you need to allocate some stuff for C, call C, and then you don't need this anymore. Kind of like t temporary scratch pad uh, memory area. And you will not have to free manually, unlike with malloc and free. And I would, I would advise that basically that's what we are doing in Java library, just quickly wrap stuff into managed object as, as fast as possible, unless you really have to keep unmanaged references alive. I mean, this is also possible. Yeah. I'm curious if, you have any, if you've seen anything weird with um, Scala collections and the way they map to, uh, to native code. Don't get me started on Scala collections. It's a <laughs> Uh, so Scala collections are hard. It's like it takes a lot of a lot of effort to compile them efficiently, and some in some pathological cases around uh, box and virtual dispatch, we're slower on Scala collections, like quite a bit slower, because like, if you have like just twice sl slow down uh, in quadratic loop, you get like way so w way higher than twice slow down overall, right? So uh, in some cases, we've seen like hundred x slow down in very pathological cases. But it's basically just a performance box we are working on right now. Um, so Scala collections are very, very uh, are written in a very high level style of Scala, like extremely high level with a lot of interaction. It's a very awesome challenge to um, fight this interaction to make it like well optimized in the final code. Do you think they can influence the collection redesign? Uh, I think we should just optimize them better. I think I, I, we don't want people to write code differently. It's like if people write very high level code, it's our, it's our job to, to optimize it well. So ScalaJS has shown us it, 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 it's doable, it just takes a lot of effort. Uh, basically, with, uh, you know, with heavy enough inlining, with heavy enough uh, optimizations, it, it's perfectly doable. So I don't think we should tell people how to write code. Uh, it's basically not our job. Um. Yeah. Uh, I remember in about 2015, at a strange rule, yeah. uh, when Eric O'Shea uh, was talking about like math and whatever, and also LLVM was mentioned. And so the general like uh, complaint was that, well, it's so much effort, uh, like we could compile to LLVM, but then all those libraries. I wonder uh, like, if this uh, development is in any way related to those like old days, two years ago. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but there was a previous attempt at Scala LVM compiler, which was called Scala LVM. Yeah. And that one didn't go very far. Uh, so it had a bit simpler architecture. It would emit LL files right from a front end. And you cannot do that much if you do that. Because, for example, in Scala, most methods are virtual. If you compile everything as virtual calls, it's going to be very slow. We kind of fix this, like, more or less now. And it really. Like LLVM doesn't like if it's if there is a high level feature uh, in your language which LLVM doesn't have, which most like in Scala there are plenty of those. It means LLVM will not optimize it. So like virtual dispatch is not LLVM's business; it's your business. Like boxing is not LLVM's business. A few other things basically, and it's our job like to make sure we we produce code uh, similar enough to C++ uh, for it to work fast. Uh, because you cannot just naively emit LLVM, like this, this is not going to work, basically. The previous approach just didn't go far enough, and it just takes way more effort to, do it, to go this way. So yeah, it's like a lot of effort. So, but right now, it's like the compiler work is like very stable, and we, we're just working on evolutionary improvements. Uh, there's really nothing super magically completely different we need to do anymore. So just basically evolutionary improvements on interop, evolutionary improvements on performance, and so on and so forth. I think the design we picked and the design we stole from Scala.js works just perfectly for, for this. Yeah. Do you know what you want to see in the 1.0 version? Cool question. Uh, what do I want to see in 1.0? So I want to see n network and threads, for sure, uh, which is probably way sooner than 1.0, but don't don't take my word on it. Uh, I want to see Windows support. I, I, I really want like this struggle. You know, this struggle kind of perseveres uh, to uh, make Scala work on Windows. Uh, I want to see uh, major uh, apps and frameworks working on Scala native. Uh, it's not really. I'm, I'm not sure if people will be interested in support those, but like if community is ever interested in porting something like Akka, just as, as soon as we have enough Java libraries, it would be really cool if someone does it. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's not within the scope of our projects to port everyone's code. Because typically, you don't really even do need to do much. You just 
change the build once we, we implement an AppJava library. So this is kind of like our mindset. But I really hope most of the major kind of like successful projects in Scala ecosystem would work on, on Scala native. It's, it's probably like, I would say it's, it's, it's going to be a very good 1.0 if all this happens. Is there anybody actually using it in production? Mm. I don't know. Uh, I, it's like three months old in terms of like first release. Uh, maybe not. Maybe yes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's like three or four months old. So yeah. Cool. Uh, I think. Um, is there anything you could do from your end to make it uh, uh, like Hacker to easily port and do Scala from your end? From my end, it's like more Java libraries. Uh, like more Java library story, like better, comp more compatible implementation of Java libraries and so on and so forth. So if it's like in one of the packages I mentioned, it's our, it's kind of like our responsibility to port it, so where was it? So langutil, io and io and net, uh, like I'm not saying we're gonna implement all of it, but the parts which people use, we're open to, open to adding them. And some of the parts are just probably not gonna happen, like HTTP client on Scala native side is not gonna happen, for example. So something like AKHTP, which does it on the third party side, might probably be a better idea. But basically, it, it, if it's a reasonable thing with this, uh, those packages, it's our job. And once it's done, the language is fully supported. So it's, it's not really a question of language anymore. It's mostly a question of having enough environment for, for library that you want to build to work. Yeah. Were you actually implementing those libraries in use right in Scala? And it's all in Scala. So there are some, in some cases, when C stuff has macros, we define like a wrapper function in C, which is just like one line of code, to just wrap a macro and expose it as a constant or expose it as a, a helper method. So it's just C code we have is very simple. The only non-trivial C code we have is uh, MXGC, like our new one. Apart from that, like 90, more than 90% of code base is Scala. I would probably, maybe even more than 90%, maybe more like 95%. And all of the Java libraries almost pure as Scala. So it's like very, very reasonable code you would probably write. Uh, just So all the Java library is just cost POSIX bindings most of the time. So basically, this is how we do it. Just normal code. Yep. So is there any overlap with Scala.js when you're re-implementing these Java libraries in Scala? Is, that, is it possible to share code or if you? <laughs> OK. So the question was, can we share code with Scala.js? In fact, our Java library implementation started this way. So we started as basically the fork of, uh, of Scala.js um, standard library. The problem to sh with code sharing is that we have very different environments we, in we kind of based on. So stuff like uh, files and sockets doesn't exist uh, in uh, JavaScript like at all. So it, like we cannot share those. And also some things which don't exist in Scala native, like for example, re regular expressions we implemented ourselves. And uh, Scala.js has just uh, wrapped uh, JavaScript regular expression, this kind of stuff, right? So it's not always you can share. And actually, if you just remove all of this, like various parts, it's going to be very complicated build to make it all share, like kind of only parts which make sense to share. But a lot of our initial Java library was basically Scala.js uh, Java library. And it's probably one of the reasons we could pull off 0 0.1 so soon, uh, because it's basically one of the like, Library story is, is probably the hardest part of this project, not uh, the compiler. Yeah? Uh, is there any desire to uh, expose Scala native libraries to the community and like, serve as libraries that other languages want to? Or is it just like standalone executable? So right now, it, it can only emit standard executables. So we cannot emit native libraries. We have a feature request, and so many people requested it that it's actually happening. So. Uh, so basically, compiling Scala native code to like SO or Dilib on a Mac, is, is this what you mean? Yeah. yeah, it's happening. So it's like probably 0 04 <laughs> happening, uh, like next release happening. So, so just so I understand, let's say we have a program that depends on a Java library like Netty, for okay. instance. And assuming that we have all the Java NIO support for that. Um, is the work to get that working for Scala native essentially to transcode Netty into Scala? Yeah. So Netty is one of the things which are like giant blockers for a lot of projects because 
Netty is a giant I.O. library, uh, which doesn't use N.I.O. by the way. It's, uh, it has insane amount of JNI code and insane amount of its own C code, which actually like wraps underlying system uh, low-level I.O. APIs. Um, so the question is, how can you port it to, to Sklyph? You probably can, but I would say it would make sense for someone to come up with our own equivalent of Netty, because you can call all of these low-level APIs directly. Uh, I would hope, like, Akka HTTP is one thing kind of I've been having in mind for a long time. Like, once we have enough Java library, Akka HTTP seems to be self-contained enough for this to just work. And maybe building on Akka HTTP is a better idea than re-implementing everything from scratch, like, like doing like native from scratch. Yeah? In, instead of rewriting Java libraries into Scala, did you consider just you know, <coughs> writing the front end? We cannot do this for legal reasons. Uh, so we are like very scared of Oracle. <laughs> we don't want to implement Java. We don't implement Java. We only implement Scala as a language. We only compile Scala files. Uh, we don't support anything apart from compiling Scala files. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>